Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. On the evening of February 9th, 2004, a black 1996 Saturn four-door sedan crashed into a ditch on Route 112 near the small New Hampshire town of Woodsville. The driver was a young 21-year-old nursing student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. A call was made to the Grifton County Sheriff's Department at 7.27 p.m. by a neighbor who noticed the wrecked car up on the snowbank along Route 112. According to the police call log, the neighbor claimed a man was smoking a cigarette in the passenger side of the car inside the wrecked car while the young woman walked around the car checking out the damage. Later on, this neighbor would claim she did not see a man smoking, but what might have been a red glowing light from a cell phone. Another call was made to the police at 7.43 p.m by another neighbor who was coming home from work and spotted the accident. Seeing a young girl in distress, he pulled over and asked if he could call the police for her. According to this neighbor, the young girl pleaded with him not to call the police, claiming she had already called AAA. The neighbor knew two things for certain. This young girl was terrified of the police and was also lying about calling AAA as he knew there was no cell phone reception in that area. Because of this, when the neighbor got home, he called the police. The official report claims the police showed up at the crash at 7.46 p.m. The officer on the scene said there was no human in sight. The young girl has never been seen again, and almost 20 years later, we still have no idea what happened to her. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a big, big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without your help, this channel would not exist. If you would like to join our Patreon or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And today in part one, we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Maura Murray. The Mara Murray case is a very, very big and very interesting case. Because of that, we are going to be dividing this case into a part one and a part two. Now, in part one, the episode you're watching now, we're going to divide it into two sections, part 1.A and part 1.B. In part 1.A, we're going to talk about who Mara Murray was, and start to look at the official timeline of her disappearance that's been given to the public. In part 1.B, we're going to be breaking down that timeline and looking at all the different theories of what possibly happened to Mara Murray. Now, like many people who've been invested in this case, I do have an opinion 
of what happened to her. And to be honest with you guys, this case has fascinated me for a very, very long time. The Mara Murray case is considered to be one of the first big social media cases. This case happened, her disappearance happened around the time that Facebook itself was just getting started. And so what I believe they mean by this is before before social media, when people would go missing, there would be documentaries, datelines, 2020s, all that kind of stuff. But with the onslaught of social media, getting the word out and having just regular citizens on the lookout for a missing person or having regular citizens be what we call armchair detectives to research and give their theories has really changed the way in which people are found. Now, with that being said, it has been almost 20 years since Mara Murray disappeared. And some people, the people who do believe she is still alive, have claimed to have seen her. But other people believe that she is no longer living. And again, we're going to talk about that, what possibly happened to her in part 1.B. But right now, let's go ahead and get started with part 1.A. Mara Murray was born on the 4th of May, 1982. She was born to her father, Fred Murray, who, who was, was a medical technician, and her mother, Lori Murray, who was a nurse. Now, Laura was born into a pretty big family. Well, big by today's standards. She was the fourth child. She had an older brother named Fred, Fred, Fred Jr., and two older sisters named Kathleen and Julie. The Murrays lived in Massachusetts, and Mara Murray herself was born in Brockton, Massachusetts. Now, when I looked at the map to look at all the different locations where the Murrays had lived, they basically kind of all lived in the same area, just south of Boston. And in fact, this whole case regarding her disappearance all happens in the New England area. And for people who are not familiar with New England, it is kind of this like cluster of states. So there are some states like Massachusetts that are pretty big, but some states are not so big. And so when we get into the timeline, in, into where her car was found, what happened, I will try my best to explain the geographical locations just for our audience watching who is not from the United States. Well, around the age of six, uh, Fred and Lori, her parents got divorced. And right after her parents got divorced, Lori Murray, her mother, got pregnant with Curtis, who is the fifth child now. On top of that, Maura and her siblings were primarily raised with their mother once their parents got divorced, which is very common. I think in most states, the mother typically gets primary custody of the children. Um, but her father, Fred, was very, very involved in his kids' lives. Now, another reason why I feel like I am very attracted to this missing persons case is because Maura Murray was only nine months older than me. Again, she was born on May 4th, 1982. I was born on February 4th, 1983. And so I feel a deep connection to Maura in a, in a lot of ways. Um, I, I, reading through this case, looking at her high school experiences, looking at her college experiences, her she had a bit of an overachiever um, persona. I, I understand that. I, I, I remember those days of being in high school and doing everything I could to get accepted into a good college and all the stress that comes with that. And so I, I do feel like for me especially, and there might be a lot of other podcasters and YouTubers out there that probably feel that same connection. Like there's this kind of understanding of what Maura was going through because in high school, she was very much an overachiever. She excelled in almost everything she did. She didn't just excel at it, though. It wasn't like she just like was naturally good at things. She really worked very hard to be the best at what she did. In fact, for academically, she was on the National Honor Society, but where she really excelled was sports. Now, according to the, the family's website, which I will link down in the description box below, she played all sorts of sports. And in fact, she really loved basketball. She did a lot with basketball, traveled all over New England with basketball, but the sport in which she really excelled was running. She was a track star as well as a cross country star. And it does seem that this was a sport that was pretty, um, 
pretty well practiced by a lot of her family members. She basically kind of came from like a running family. And we do know that Fred, the father, was very involved in coaching the girls. He really worked with the girls, especially, especially Julie and Maura on their athletics. Now, many people have kind of come down hard on Fred, like pushing him, um, because maybe he pushed them too much in the sports. But again, Curtis, the little brother, so that that really wasn't true. And from other episodes I've seen or, or interviews I've seen with Fred, he pushed them where they wanted to be pushed. He has said many times, as well as Curtis and other family members, that if the girls all of a sudden weren't interested in, in running anymore, Fred would have been fine with that as well. He just seemed to be very involved with them. And, and I can ex I can respect that. I think that is one way in this case where perhaps maybe the media has sensationalized something that doesn't need, need to be sensationalized. Her parents were divorced. Maura and her siblings primarily lived with the mother, Lori. And so it is natural for the father, we think about father energy, to want to be involved in his children's lives. And one way where a father might excel in his children's lives is their sports. According to MauraMurrayMissing.org, Maura was a fierce competitor who finished as a top-tier runner in Massachusetts and broke several long-standing school records. Now, again, the reason why I reiterate this is because this is something very important to remember as we move into part 1.B of this story. When we look at Mara's capacity, her lung capacity, when it comes to surviving in the mountains in winter and her level of physical fitness, we know that long distance runners, especially cross country runners, which was something Mara did, it is that sport is what you think it is it's cross country track you're on a pretty even keel track but in cross country you are trail running and so for mora even at her university even if she's not running competitively in her university she was still a runner and so her physical fitness her ability her body's ability to take in oxygen was a lot better and she was way better equipped to survive the Appalachian Mountains than maybe just an average Joe on the street. So I, I really want you guys just to keep that, hold that into consideration because it is going to come up later in the story. In the year 2000, Mora graduated from Whitman Hanson High School with top marks academically and a record-breaking athletic resume. Mora had her pick of universities. In my opinion, Mora made a bold move when she decided to accept a congressional nomination from the state senator, Edward Kennedy, to start her college journey at the prestigious United States Military Academy at West Point. For our non-American viewers, this is simply just called West Point here in the United States, but I wanted to read out the full title of the, of the college because um, this is a big deal. This is... From some of the statistics I read and looked up, they only accept about 10% of the applicants who actually apply to West Point. It is military based. And so the kids who decide to go to university here, they're not only expected to keep up with university classes themselves, but also they are expected to constantly be doing um, military training. And of course, because of that, you know, a lot of college campuses or university campuses for our viewers who are from another another um, country in the United States, I know in England and other and other parts of the world, college and university are two different things. But in the United States, those are interchangeable words. So I want to make that very clear in case you hear me going in and out with the word college and university. It's the same thing here in the United States. It's the it's the place you go to for high for an undergrad you know, for higher education after you have finished high school, basically your, your 12th year of school. So this is university for lack of a better word. So she was 18 when she when she went to West Point. And that just also shows you how smart she was and how adept she was because they they offered her an actual scholarship to go to West Point, whereas most kids were just trying crossing their fingers and trying to get in. But I also want to reiterate, like this is not most, well, not most, 
there are a lot of universities here in the United States that are considered to be like party schools. So like here in the state of Georgia, our state university is the University of Georgia over in Athens, Georgia, where my friend who's on the channel a lot, Angie is from. Both of my parents went to the University of Georgia and my father also went to veterinary school at the University of Georgia. Now that University of Georgia is one of the most prestigious universities in the United States that with the University of Virginia, there's some other big ones. But West Point was a little bit different because at the University of Georgia, all these other universities, you do have a sense of party. You do have a sense of kids letting loose. They're in this time in their life where they're finally out of the house. They're in, they're joining sororities, joining fraternities. They're they're experimenting with their boundaries when it comes to no no real rules and regulations and how to how to self govern without being at home and learning how to maintain their their academics work along with again being out in the world socializing as an adult but with west point again you're, she's not in this situation she's she's definitely being monitored she's having to work her ass off a lot of kids go to university and they gain the the freshman 15 because they're eating junk food. That's that's probably not happening at West Point because they're working their asses off physically and keeping it. It's, it's military. It's absolute military. Well, Laura's older sister, Julie, was also at West Point. And Julie herself has been very instrumental in Maura's disappearance. And you can definitely tell from Julie that, that this is a this is a very hardworking, very physically fit woman even today. Well, around Mara's second year, she started to have some issues at West Point. Now, according to her family's website, she decided that she the military lifestyle was not for her. And so she withdrew from West Point. I totally understand that. Uh, the military life is not for me either, even though I'm a hardcore exerciser. I also don't like being told what to do all the time. Um, so, so I totally understand if that's the case, but it does seem like the family did sugarcoat that for their website because we do have evidence that Maura had been called before the discipline disciplinary committee of West Point about seven times before her withdrawal. Now, again, it I, places like West Point, I don't know. It could be that you didn't make your bed up properly or you were late to a training. That might be something that renders you to the disciplinary committee at somewhere le well, like West Point. But we do know that Mora had finally, what, what finally instigated her withdrawal from West Point was that she got caught shoplifting some makeup from Fort Knox, from the Fort Knox commissary shops which is pretty bold move to do it almost sounds like she was like crying out for help in my opinion because i don't think anybody would be successful at shoplifting makeup from fort knox mara did admit to this theft and so she was dismissed she withdrew from west point and she re-enrolled herself into the university of massachusetts at amherst which is again called in the united states umass so if you hear me for our for our viewers that are not from the united states i will thus forth be referring to her new university as umass now this is a typical university like the university of georgia or any other university where now she's got a little bit more freedom she does change her study to nursing like her mother um this is notoriously a very hard degree to get 20 years ago you were expected to earn your grades you were expected to do the hard work so i'm, I'm not gonna I'm not going to sugarcoat that. She was under some stress, even as a nursing student, but at least she was in a, in a, in a university that was maybe more a little bit more relaxed. She didn't have the also have the pressure of being a star athlete, of, of all these other things that, that West Point was putting on her shoulders. And it does appear that Maura did very quickly make friends, that she did create a little new little so social circle of girlies that were her friends at UMass. In November of 2003, though, just a few mere months before Mara would disappear, she got into some trouble again. She got in trouble for credit card theft. She um, charged about $79 to food delivery services 
using somebody else's credit card. Now, it was one of the other girls that lived in the dorm with her at UMass. Um, she had noticed that there was um, big food charges to like a couple of pizza places and stuff like that. And so she called the police. The police literally tracked down an, an, an order that Mara had placed and the delivery guy brought the food to the dorm. And after she signed the credit card receipt, that's when the, the cops um, confronted her. She was brought to trial in December of 2003, but because the theft was under $250, the judge just basically told Mara to pay back the money. And if she was good, now I want you guys to remember this, this is important. If she was good for three months, then the, this arrest would basically be taken off of her record. But if she wasn't, if she got into trouble in the next three months, then she would be charged with credit card and identity theft. So just remember that, guys. Three months she had to be clean in order. That was the choice, right? She was either going to have this completely taken off of her record. All she needed to do was pay back the $79 or she was going to be fully charged with identity and credit card theft. Now, here's what's interesting about Mora. I see Mora's um, propensity to steal as being um, a sign of, of a mental struggle. Now with this credit card, because it doesn't seem like she's actually actively trying to go out and seek theft, because according to her, she found the credit card number on a receipt in the girl's bathroom at the dorm. So it was just kind of like a happenstance of where she was at that time. It's not like she knew the girl and like picked her pocket. She just got the card number off of a receipt. Now, thank you to some other podcasters that brought this up. They actually looked up laws regarding credit card numbers. And now if you put something on a credit card or a debit card, they X out all the numbers except maybe the four at the end. Well, 20 years ago, this was not the case. 20 years ago, they fully had the credit card numbers on receipts. So from what these other podcasters said, given their research, and I agree with them, that story does seem accurate, that she literally just found the receipt. So that says to me, she's not a malicious person. She's not someone that's out there trying to plot ways to, to steal from people. She's just seeing opportunities. And for some reason, she's acting those opportunities out almost like an adrenaline rush. We also know that Mora was not somebody who was financially struggling. She worked multiple jobs. And even though she came from a middle class family, it wasn't like she couldn't ask her parents for help if she needed help. She wasn't starving. She wasn't somebody that was stealing food because she couldn't feed herself. There's also something else I would like to bring up in this as well. And a lot of different podcasters and armchair detectives have spoken about this, the potential that Mora had an eating disorder. And I have a lot to say about this. And I'm not saying she did, and I'm not saying she didn't. I just want to give my experience um, and why I think this might potentially show maybe some of the obsessive compuls compulsion that Mora had and maybe spoke more to her anxiety. When she was placing these orders with the credit card, she was ordering a lot of food each time. Is it possible that she was ordering food for friends too? Maybe. But it seems like that she maybe was a binge eater. Now, I don't know if she, if she, if she did have an eating disorder. I don't know if it was just binge eating or if it was bulimia where she was throwing it up later. But I will say something that I have yet to hear somebody bring up. And again, this is coming from my experience. This is not necessarily what was happening to Mora, but maybe this is another perspective that we could take. As I've said before on this channel, I am a huge exerciser. I, like Mora, ran cross country in high school. I ran throughout my university years too. I was a law, I was like her, I was a cross country long distance runner. I now am the only female authorized Ashtanga teacher in the state of Georgia. And Ashtanga is an incredibly physically demanding practice. And to be authorized, you have to make it to a certain level physically in the practice in order to be able to teach. So that gives you kind of an understanding of what I've put my body through. Now, with that being said, too, because my running in college and in my work as a, an Ashtanga practitioner and teacher 
we don't have an off season. We're always repeatedly working out and exercising. Now, when you're involved in a sport, and I've seen this with myself, I've also seen this within my colleagues and my peers, especially a, a sport that's like long distance running, swimming, something like Ashtanga, you start to become very subtly aware of the food you eat. And when you eat too much, it starts to create a heaviness in your body. And you feel that heaviness. So if I were to binge eat a big cheesy pizza right now, and then tomorrow morning try to go for like a six mile run, it would not be pleasant because I would feel that in my stomach. The same with Ashtanga. When you're trying to put your leg behind your head or do forward and back handsprings, if you've got a heaviness in your stomach, it's going to cause problems within the activity. Now, it's even more so if you are competitive. Like if you are running races, that's even that's even more so of, of how it affects your time, your speed, all that kind of stuff. And so what tends to happen is that people, not just women, but men too, will pick up a disordered eating where they will try to just naturally refrain from eating enough so that they have a lighter load, literally a lighter load in their stomach so they can go faster or they can have a, a more stable practice, whatever it is. I'm sure this is true in almost every sport where things like time and precision matter, right? And so what tends to happen though, is you end up, you do end up, or in a lot of cases, people do end up creating uh, their own eating disorder, but it doesn't come from the traditional places eating disorders come from. It ends in the same result, but it's coming from a different motivation. Because when you're doing things like long distance running, long distance swimming, ashtanga, all these things, you are burning a shit ton of calories. And your body starts, you know, the body in motion stays in motion. And so your metabolism gets upped. So that is going to not, that is going to cause you to get a lot hungrier sometimes. And when you're trying to restrict yourself and you're feeling that hunger pain, you're going to go through episodes where you then lose control and binge. And then after you binge, you're probably going to throw it up because you don't want to feel that heaviness tomorrow when you go for your run. I believe with a lot of people, and that's something that I try to be very, very careful with, um, with Ashtanga, Harmony Slater, who is a friend of mine, a female teacher up in Canada. Um, one time she was teaching here in Atlanta and a, a woman was working on a particular transition, um, pinch my rasana, uh, kranavasana, where you're, in, you're up in your forearm stand and you're kicking your legs and pulling them in your stomach and lifting. It's a very complicated transition. And this one student that we have here in Atlanta have been working on this for a really long time and was just having a really hard time executing the, the, the transition, which is normal. It takes a long time, especially for women because it's a lot of upper body strength. And she had asked Harmony, um, is there anything I can do to help me figure this out? And in the moment, Har Harmony said, just keep practicing. After class, she said, I could have told her if you lose 10 pounds, you'll be able to do this, but I'm not going to because I don't want to cause an eating disorder for her. So in telling you that story, I want you to see how, how okay, yeah, if I'm an athlete, if I want to you know, do this, this thing, this transition, and I lose 10 pounds, it'll make it easier. And all of a sudden, you start to realize how subtly the food affects you within your own performance in your sport. And then over time, it starts to become such a pattern with you. And I, and if Mara had an eating disorder, I believe that that's where it came from. I believe it came from her cross country running, I believe it was something that she figured out maybe even in high school that if she had a light stomach and no food in it, she could run faster and further, that she would have more bodily control over herself when her stomach was empty and lighter in her sport. And it, what started off as something very innocent, well, I just won't eat a lot the night before my meat or something like that, turned into a full-fledged eating disorder. So I think that is what where that started. And I do believe there is enough evidence to suggest that she probably was binging and purging. Just looking at the pictures of her and how thin she was and knowing how much food she was consuming. 
Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make that clear. I don't know that for sure. That's just my opinion. But I wanted to, a lot of people who suspect she did have this issue, it seems like they weren't even putting into the equation the running. And that is something that I actually understand. And I, I hope I did a good job explaining that because this is very common with athletes. It's very common. I know so many people in the Ashtanga world who have a problem with this. This is really common for athletes. And I'm going to throw the Ashtanga people in there as athletes for this conversation. Um, it's just very common. Okay. And it's not coming from the same place. It's, it's coming from the same intention. And that intention is to control, to have more control over your body. But it's not coming from the same place as somebody who just develops it in their life. It's a different stress, but for the same reason of in controlling your body, if that makes sense. And it does, it will have devastating effects on you if it continues. And so, and it is a sign of stress. Again, it's anxiety over keeping that perfectionism in your sport. I, I hope that makes sense. And if you want me to elaborate on that phenomenon more in a separate video, I will be more than happy to. But this is common with athletes. I'm sure my friend Jamie Soleil, my gold medalist Olympic ice skating friend, probably has seen this before too. If I had, if I had to bet, I bet she knows exactly what I'm talking about with ice skaters. I, this is probably common with them too. So I just wanted to put that out there. So her having an eating disorder might not be caused by the same stress that other is still coming from a need of perfection, but with, from another instigator. I hope that makes sense. But anyway. There's that. I also want to mention that Mora was not only the Murray kid to have some sort of continual problem. Um, it is very well documented that Mora's sister Kathleen has struggled with addiction. However, according to interviews, again, with Curtis, their half brother on the Missing Mora Murray podcast, Kathleen's addiction problem started with a suicide that she felt responsible for when her fiance died when she was only 19. And Kathleen was older than Maura, so this would have been before Maura's disappearance. And a lot of people, I, I thought it was great that Curtis kind of cleared his sister's name because in a lot of documentaries, people think Kathleen knows more than she's saying regarding her um, addiction problems and Maura's disappearance. But Curtis said, no, what she's hiding is the fact that she was engaged to a man who unalived himself. And in his unaliving himself note, he blamed Kathleen for it. And she was only 19 years old. So that was most likely the uh, the thing that instigated her drug addiction. So I just wanted to, to make that clear because that's going to come up probably more in part 1.B. So leading up to Mara's disappearance on February 9th, 2004, we're going to start with February 5th, 2004, which was actually one day after my 21st birthday. So there's that. I know exactly where I was when all of this was happening for Mora, I was not near Massachusetts. So it's interesting to go back in your life and go, oh my God, where was I at this time when this person was going through one of the most stressful situations that she was in. But anyway, February 5th, 2004 is where this is all going to kick off for us when we start looking at the timeline. So again, Mara, Mara wor worked many part-time jobs. And um, one of these part-time jobs was like a security job at University of Massachusetts or UMass. And she had a night shift that night. So she, she got to work at like 10.30 p.m. And according to her colleagues, everything was well and good. She did get a phone call from her sister Kathleen at some point where she was visibly upset on the phone. Um, it seems that Kathleen had just got out of a, another rehab facility. And I think that the siblings were so close that it was just very upsetting. It's a lot for anybody to take in the devastating effect of addiction on a sibling or a parent. But to be that young, Maura's age and to to have to hear your sister go through so much um, with her addiction and knowing the backstory too of why her sister was in the position she was in was a lot for Maura to take in. And so she was pretty shooken up by this conversation. We also know that after she spoke with her sister Kathleen from 1207 to 1214, she had a phone call with her boyfriend, a man named Billy Roush. And we will speak more on Billy later in um, this video because he does come up as a suspect. But for now, I don't really want to focus on him too much. I just want to get through the timeline of events before we start breaking down every person involved, all the spinning wheels involved in this story. But from 1207 to 1214, she did have a phone conversation with Billy. 
Now, Billy did not live in Massachusetts. He uh, some some reports say that she he was her uh, high school sweetheart. Other reports say that he met her at West Point, but he was in a military esque situation at another school. So they were a long distance relationship. And whatever they talked about on the phone from 1207 to 1214 really did upset Mora to the point where she was really just not able to work. They called the supervisor of their job and she took Mora, walked Mora, escorted her back to her dorms. So that shows you kind of the state of Mora's mind. Something really upset her and um, to the point where someone had to escort her home. It, well, they, they didn't trust her to walk home by herself. And her escort home happened around 1.20 a.m. The supervisor all said all more kept saying was my sister, my sister, my sister, which is very odd because, yes, she was upset on the phone with Kathleen, but not as upset as after she got off the phone call with Billy. Um so I don't know if if she was using her sister as a reasonable excuse as to why she was having an emotional breakdown or if Billy had said something about her sister. I, I don't know, but that's very odd. And that's something I wanted to note here in this video. But nonetheless, on Saturday, February 7th, Fred Murray, Maura's father, drove to Amherst to help Maura buy a new car. Now, she was driving the 1996 Saturn sedan, four-door, simple little car. And apparently, this car was quite a lemon. I've had lemons before. Annoying. And Fred was going to just bite the bullet and get his daughter a safe new car. Now, a lot of podcasters kind of question this. Like, was he really buying her a car? And I, to them, I say, like, yeah, I, I believe him because... I know for some parents, they don't buy their kids cars and some parents can't afford to buy their kids cars. My parents bought my sister and me cars. And um, when you're kidding your kid a car, if you can afford it, Fred obviously can afford it. You're obviously going to get your kid a used car, but you want to make sure it's a safe car, especially for a young girl. And Maura had to drive around a lot for her nursing um, she worked rotations through her nursing school, and he was very concerned. Her car broke down all the time. And so that concerned him as a father for her safety, that she was, especially in a place like Massachusetts, where the winters are very tumultuous, he didn't want her to get hurt in a car. So I absolutely, I don't think this is weird. I think this is very normal for a family um, with their economic, uh, their socioeconomic background to be able to afford to get their kid a safe car. And if you can afford to get your kid a safe car, you're going to, right? It's not, you're not buying a Mercedes. You're just getting them a reliable car that's going to help them start their life and, and get to school safely. So I don't think this is weird at all. But nonetheless, he picked Mara up in the morning from her dorm and they spent all day just car shopping, looking at different options, Again, they made no purchase that day, but that's not shocking to me. I think you, you do. That's, that's being smart and responsible with finances to be able to kind of look at what's available and try to figure out the best deal for your child. That evening, um, Fred took Mora and one of her friends, a girl named Katie, out to dinner. Again, nothing weird about that. Katie said they never mentioned the car shopping, which some people find that strange. I don't. Like, why are you going to talk about buying your kid a car in front of one of her friends? That could be kind of rude. Especially, we don't know much about this Katie girl, like what her background was. Like, you don't want to like rub it in someone's face that your dad's getting your car. Like, I don't know. I just feel like, and you don't want to have, it's, it's three people are having at the table, having a conversation. You don't want to be rude and talk about a family thing, getting a transportation. So I, I don't know. Maybe I'm giving them a little bit too much too much slack in this or fred too much slack in this but i just don't see that as being odd that they didn't talk about car shopping with katie anyway fred did take the girls to a liquor store after that where they got some liquor because they were going to go to a dorm party that night now this is a little strange to me what happened next uh fred had mora drop him off at his hotel and he let her take his brand new Toyota 
to a college dorm party where there was obviously going to be drinking involved. They arrived at the party around 10.30 p.m. and then Mora left the party at 2.30 a.m. on Sunday, February 8th, early in the mornings of that Sunday. It is said that a few of the people at the party did want Mora to stay just for the night there because she had been drinking, but she felt really rushed to get her car back to her father to drop it off at the hotel. And on her way back, she had a car accident. Not the car accident that's going to trigger her disappearance, but like another car. So she's going to have two car accidents in a row. Talk about trauma. And it seems that she came to what we call like a T intersection where she was driving up a road and then the road stopped and you could either turn right or turn left. And Mara just drove straight through into the guardrail. She drove so forcefully into the guardrail that it did total the brand new Toyota. Now, at that point, Mora did call the police. The police came and they just wrote out an incident report. There is no evidence that they gave her a sobriety test. There was no evidence that any type of, of um, drugs or alcohol were tested on her which seems like at that time of night, um, with an accident like that, where you literally, you, know, you didn't hit another car, another car didn't hit you, you literally just drove straight into a guardrail. Um, it, it, that seems very peculiar to me, um, that they would not, even if you were stone cold sober and just kind of fell asleep at the wheel, they probably still would test you for alcohol. And if they had tested her for alcohol and she had been drinking, which we do know she had been drinking, not saying she was drunk, we don't know that, but that she had been drinking, she probably would have been arrested that night for a DUI, which she was not. The cop let her go. They towed the car um, to a, a car wreckage place and she got um, a ride back to her father's hotel. Now, they do say, Fred did say he just woke up in the morning with her there. He doesn't remember her coming into the hotel. She didn't have a key. So that's odd, too. But nonetheless, she gets back to her father's hotel around 4 o'clock in the morning. And we do know that at 4.49 a.m., Mora did call her boyfriend, Billy, again on her father's cell phone because her cell phone had died and it lost its charge and she did not have her charger with her. Billy went on to say that conversation basically was how upset Mora was about the car accident, how she was terrified to tell her dad that she had totaled his brand new Toyota. And that was basically the extent of it. In the morning when Fred woke up and Mora told Fred that she had wrecked his brand new Toyota, Fred said that he wasn't that upset, that he was just really happy that Mora was safe, which I, I know most parents, when their child is in a car accident, you are glad that they are safe, but my parents would have killed me. Like if I had totaled their brand new Toyota um, and I had been drinking, then uh, I definitely, I would probably be less afraid of my, of the police than my parents at that point. So, I mean, some people find that kind of odd. I guess Fred does have to take some responsibility where he gave his daughter, his young daughter, his Toyota to drive. And he knew she was going to a, uh, a party where there's going to be alcohol. I don't know, but nonetheless, Fred was like, you know what? You're alive. That's all that matters. Insurance is going to take care of it. No big deal. Um, let me just take you back to your dorm. So this was, again, on Sunday, the 8th of February. After Fred dropped Mora back at school, he proceeded to go to Connecticut where he had a job. We know that he did call Mora around 11.30 p.m. that night to confirm that she would go to the Registry of Motor Vehicles to pick up the accident form so they could pass it over to the insurance company. They agreed that they would speak again Monday evening, February 9th, to finish the paperwork over the phone. So this is where we get into the timeline of Mora's disappearance. Her computer records do show that she was looking up directions to the Berkshires in Burlington, Vermont, a little bit past midnight on Monday, February 9th. Now, the Berkshires, for those who are not familiar, is a very popular place in New England for like a weekend getaway. It's in the Appalachian Mountains, and all, this whole story is in the, in the northern part of the Appalachian Mountains, not my area 
up in New England, close to Canada. This is a popular place, like a weekend place for people to go. And so she was looking on her computer. This is the first sign we see of her looking to escape, basically. Um, just so much had happened to her. She was under so much stress and she was on her computer just looking at directions to the Berkshires in Burlington, Vermont. Now, for the young people who happen to be listening right now, back at this time, because again, I was in college at this time too. Mara's only a few uh, nine months older than me. We had this theme called MapQuest, and some of you guys might remember it um, if you're around my age. Before MapQuest, we used little literal maps, and that is something that I learned how to read when I was young, learned how to read a map, so I can still read a map, which is great. I don't know if kids today could read an actual map. We didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones back then. And so MapQuest was kind of like that transitional period between an actual map and GPS that we have now. And so basically what you would do is you would Google in the place that you want to go and your location, and it would give you step-by-step -step directions. So, so you would print them out. So there was no voice telling you, no Surrey voice saying, turn here at the next light. No, you would have to like read the directions and get yourself there from what the directions were telling you. So this is what she was doing. And we, we know this from a few places throughout the, the upcoming day before she leaves. She was looking for hotels, for condos to rent uh, last minute, um, directions to different places to, to get away, just for what would be look, what would look like a weekend getaway. After she Googled the directions to uh, the Berkshires in Burlington, Vermont, she uh, obviously went to bed because we don't see any action from her on her devices until about 1 p.m., on Monday, February 9th. At 1 p.m., she sends Billy, again, her boyfriend, an email telling him that she loves him and that she will call him later. We also know uh, at, right after that, she did start calling around to a couple of vacation rentals um, in Burlette, New Hampshire, which was a place she was very familiar with because her apparently her family used to go there when she was a child. And so she knew the area. Now, we did have confirmation from some of the people she spoke to that she never rented. She was just inquiring about prices and availability. At 1.13 p.m., we do know that Maura calls another nursing student. We don't know why, though. This was just someone she was in school with, not necessarily a friend, just a peer. At 1.24 p.m., Maura emailed a work supervisor just to say that she would be out due to a death in the family. However, the family has verified that there was no such death. She also told her work supervisor that she would let them know when she was going to come back. And this was a work supervisor through school, through her nursing program. So basically like a professor that she was letting them know that, that she was going to be gone due to a death in the family. And she would let the professor know when she was going to come back. At 2.05 p.m., she called around hotels in Stowe, Vermont, inquiring again about hotel prices. At 2.18 p.m., she leaves her boyfriend a voicemail saying she would call him later. At 3.30 p.m., Maura's car, her Saturn, her beat-up car, is seen leaving campus. Now, at this point, it is important to note that they had already called off classes for the rest of the day due to an incoming snowstorm and this is pretty serious for this area they're used to snowstorms they're used to having to work and live in snow so the fact that they did close cl classes down gives you an indication of of this was going to be a pretty pretty major storm that was due to come into the area at 3 40 p.m bait cameras show her withdrawing about 280 dollars from her account she was alone when she did this, we know that after she went to the bank, she did go by a liquor store where she spent $40 on booze. We also know that she did pick up the incident report that day that her father wanted her to grab for the insurance claims. Now, at 4.37 p.m., she checks her voicemail. And this is important because due to phone towers in the area, we know that by 5 p.m. she was already heading north on I-91. And we know that because she checked her voicemail at 4.37 p.m. And then we have no official report of her until 7.27 p.m. when the first call is made 
to the police regarding the accident on Route 112. And then at 7.46 p.m., we have the second call from the passerby who actually spoke to Mora regarding her wreck on Route 112. And then according to the police records, the police got to the site of the accident at 7.46 p.m. When the police got to the scene of her accident on Route 112, they found her car locked with no one there. No one was around. She was not there. When they finally got into her car, they found her suitcase where she had packed basically an over where she had basically packed a bag for what appeared to be, again, a weekend getaway. She had clothes, workout clothes, running clothes, makeup, her birth control, and like a little duffel bag. They also found a bunch of alcohol, some spilled wine. It had was obvious that someone had been drinking in the car. But they did notice that Mora's purse that uh, supposedly probably had her, her ID and her debit cards and credit cards and cell phone were gone. So initially at 7.46 p.m. when the cops got there, they felt like she had just left the car. She voluntarily left the car maybe to go find help. Um, this area does, did not get cell phone reception. So at first the cops were not super concerned. Um, it just really looked like she went for help. Even though there was spilled alcohol in the car, they didn't know if she had been drinking or not. This, this Route 112 was notorious for Rex. It was a very sharp turn. And so this was not surprising. So it didn't necessarily mean that they were looking for like a drunk driver. This was common to happen at this particular sharp turn in this small town. All right, you guys, let's get started with part one point B of the whole part one of this episode. I know this episode is a lot longer than my normal episodes and we will be doing a part two with my friend jessica jones the cryptid huntress who is a remote viewer she has worked cases with police before for missing bodies and so i gave her a blind target basically i what a blind target is is i gave her coordinates um, these coordinates don't have anything to do with location or anything like that. They're just coordinates to an energy of a person. And she is remote viewing. She has no idea the name of this person, what this case is. She just has the blind target. And as I'm recording this right now, pre-filming this right now, she is actually remote viewing at this very moment, getting the, the, the data, the data that um, she she needs to do part two with us so she can go over what she found regarding Mara Murray's disappearance. And I want to make something very clear. Um, I, Jessica and I are probably going to move forward doing a lot of missing persons, persons cases and cold case cases. Now, with that being said, um, if you are following along on Gnostic TV, you know that Jessica and I with the Bell Witch Part 2, we talked about laws of consent. And so for me, when it comes to divination, especially for someone like Jessica who can remote view, you have to kind of have some ethical standards about basically spying on someone who has not given their consent. So this is a very tricky subject for her and for me because, of, because both of us do have those moral standards where we don't want to invade somebody's privacy if they don't want to be found. So with that being said, there is a possibility, and we're going to get into it with all the theories, that Mara Murray could still be alive. With that being said, most likely she is dead. And so this makes this case a cold case. It's about a 20-year-old case now. And so I feel a little bit more comfortable. And I think Jessica also feels a little bit more comfortable doing a remote viewing when it, there's a high, highly likely that she met foul play. And so if this... If, if, if psychic abilities can help put uh, give closure to a suffering family, um, you know, then that that's great. Um, so with that being said, with cases going forward, any cases that are new or someone has just gone missing, I probably won't touch. I will let the police officers do what they need to do. Private investors, investigators doing what they need to do to help find this person. But for a YouTuber, 
I feel like that would be crossing a boundary. And so I will probably only be working with cold cases with Jessica when it comes to remote viewing. I hope that makes sense. It's just an ethical standard. Again, people do have the right, adults in the United States and in most other countries, legal adults do have the right to disappear. And people will disappear for many different reasons. Some of them is for their own protection. And so with that being said, for somebody who has disappeared to protect themselves, it would not be good of me or Jessica or anybody to try to locate them when they don't want to be found. All right. So with that being said, I wanted to go ahead and get that out of the way. Secondly, I want to make you guys aware that they, when we go through these theories of what happened to her, and there's a lot, uh, there have been psychics who have worked this case. And I do have the notes from some of the big psychics that have worked this case, but I'm not going to be covering what they found um, in this episode. I'm going to hold off on what I know some psychic mediums have have discovered until we do our episode with Jessica. So for this part, one point B, we're just going to go over the big theories out there. We're going to talk about some of the players involved in the Mara Mori um, fandom. I, sh I hate to say it that way, but it, it, she has become a celebrity. She's one of the most famous missing persons cases in the United States. And so there's a lot of as I said in part 1.8, a, a lot of armchair detectives out there that have put a lot of time and effort into trying to locate this woman. Now, for me, I can understand why people um, are obsessed with this case. This case is literally, as as they said on the Missing Mara Mari, Mari podcast, this case is literally one mystery after another. We don't know why she was up in the White Mountains area. We don't know why she went up there. We don't know why she didn't tell anybody she was going up there. Allegedly didn't tell anybody she was going up there, which we'll get into. And then again, we don't know what happened to her. So um, so we're going to try to unpack all of this. I also, for me especially, and, I, and I'm probably not the only one that feels this way. I This is the first time I've, I've ever talked about Mara Murray on my channel. But the Mara Murray case has haunted me for many, many, many years, long before I was even on youtube there are just some some crazy cases that you feel personally connected to and i know that sounds wild because i never knew mara but i think it's because there's a lot about mara murray's personality that i feel akin to and we can get into that in my speculations and i i under I understand i feel like how she was feeling and also she was my age she she was nine months older than me so i know this time period i know and so some of the reasons why she got lost might be no pun intended but lost to a younger generation but we're going to get into like why she you know, why she did some of the things she did which weren't peculiar to people who were her age in 2004 like myself if that makes sense so anyway guys now another thing i want to point out with this case normally when i do um solo videos by myself i try not to look at my notes i will look at my notes and then i will shoot what i want to say cut look again because i want it to be very clean but with part 1b um i'm gonna have to look back and forth at my notes so i apologize if that's distracting because there is so much here to go through that i don't want to miss anything accidentally and i want to make sure i'm as clear as possible with all of the different theories that are out there so you guys can join in in the conversation and hopefully you will be um well versed in this case by the time uh we do the remote viewing with jessica so please excuse me for going back and forth when i when i film with other people i will look at notes because it's a it's a it's a two-way conversation but with just me i always want to make sure it's clear and precise and i hope that that doesn't bother you guys so let's go ahead and get into it so a brief brief recap leading up to february 9th of 2004 the day mar murray went missing she was under a lot of stress as you guys know she had had a couple of incidents of um stealing like she got kicked out of west point because she had shoplifted from fort knox which is literally the most secure place in the world and then she had stolen a credit card number from a bathroom in her dormitory at umass where she had ordered like 79 dollars worth of delivery food so the things that she was st was stealing like at fort knox it was like makeup right she's not she's not 
a, a kleptomaniac in the sense that that she was in desperate need of stuff. She had resources. She had money. She came from a very supportive family. She was in a good school. And these are the only two incidents that we know of her stealing. But the judge in December of 2003, the judge told Maura Murray that if she had a clean record for three months straight, she was basically on a probation, right? That that she would not be criminally charged for identity theft and credit card theft. Okay. And so having that criminal charge on your record is a pretty big deal, especially if you're only 21 years old and you're just starting out your life. This is something that future employers would have to know, you would have to disclose to when you were applying for jobs. So this was a pretty big deal. And I, I do think that's why the judge was pretty lenient with her and kind of had some compassion for her. She was young. She was dumb. Not not young and dumb. Not She was very smart. Trust me. We're going to get into that. She was very academically smart, but she just was finding her way in this world and one goof up one mistake I, I could see how this judge did not want that one mistake to kind of ruin her life especially for only 79 dollars. so the judge basically was like listen honey if you can pay the 79 dollars back and you can stay clean for three months we are gonna take this off your record this will not be on your record and so you know that she got lucky she got really lucky with that judge and i think that what resulted in her actions to leave town was the stress of knowing she had wrecked her father's car. So once again, the night before she went missing, February 8th, she had gone to, excuse me, two nights before she went missing, the 7th, leading into the morning of the 8th, she went to a dorm party with her dad's car she probably was drinking. We don't know for sure because there was no sobriety test taken at the time. I don't know why there was no sobriety test taken, but she got into a car accident, a pretty big car accident, totaled her dad's car. And I think she was very stressed about this uh, being against her uh, with, with her credit card and identity that she could have gotten in more trouble and had this criminal charge on her record. And so that's kind of for me, that's really important information leading up to her disappearance. So I hope that recap was the most important thing is, is there was a lot of stress and anxiety in her life leading up to her disappearance. Now, something that I wrote in my notes as I was once again going through all the evidence in this case is, yes, Mara Murray was very smart. She scored like a 1420 on her SATs. She was very academically talented but i i wrote in my notes i said super smart but what about common sense and at 21 years old you are also not going to be the brightest and you're probably going to overreact anyway the, the frontal lobe of your brain isn't even done developing until you're about 25 but some of mara's actions i, I kind of see this as either she was really stressed out and reacting in ways that weren't that great right before she disappeared or did she just not have street smarts or common sense so that's something i wanted to bring to the table that it could have been that she just was not intellectually prepared for what was about to happen to her all right but the main theories we have going into this case of what happened to her are police cover-up was there was this a police cover-up was the family involved was it a suicide? Was she trying to escape to Canada? Was it a serial killer? Or did locals have something to do with her disappearance? And once again, I wrote in my notes here, I said, um, I just wrote in my notes and I circled it. What was she doing on the road in the middle of the night? So once we figure out what she was doing on that road, in the middle of the night, about 140 miles away from UMass, I think that will give us some sort of clarity as to what happened to her. But nobody fully knows why she was there. We all have our speculations. I have my speculations as to why she was there. But at this point, it's just speculation because we don't know for sure why she was there. All right. Um, I also wrote in my notes, this case is overwhelming because there are so many layers, right? There's mystery upon mystery upon mystery in this case that ultimately led to her disappearance. I was this morning when I was prepping to, to come in and film, I was saying to my boyfriend, I was like, 
this was the perfect storm. In my opinion, it was like the, the stars just aligned and people were just in this place at this exact moment. And I believe that's what caused her disappearance. But we'll get into that later on. Like, I don't think any of this was planned. I don't think there's some big, like, big plan in this. I think I think that this was just circumstantial or happenstantial. So let's let's continue. Now, I want to cover the um, theory that she is still alive and living in Canada uh, first. So where her car wrecked was at the base of the White Mountains. And she herself was very familiar with the White Mountains. This is all part of Appalachia. She, as a little girl, would go with her father and her siblings a lot to this area to hike and camp. According to her father, Fred Murray, this was like her place of solace. This is what she knew, this area. So I I just want to put that out there. So if, And they did find something I didn't say in part 1.A was they did find in her car a book about hiking trails in the White Mountains. So we can maybe make a, 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 a educated guess that she was heading towards a specific particular place in New Hampshire that she was very familiar with as a child. And I absolutely understand that. Like, you know, for me, places, if I needed to get out of the city of Atlanta really quickly and go back to somewhere that I was really comforted by and familiar with from my childhood, I would go to Charleston, South Carolina. I would go to the beaches of Charleston because that's where I spent my summers as a kid with, and I loved my grandparents. And you know, that, that's, that to me, that that still is a place of innocence for me. And that's it too, right? Like these places we go to when we're children are places of innocence and to be back there to kind of um, reset yourself, to find somewhere familiar and comforting while you sort through whatever it is you needed to sort through. Now, something interesting I want to point out as well, um, before we get into the Canada uh, uh, theory is uh, Maggie, uh, Maggie Furling, who is an investigative, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigator, uh, investigative journalist, did a huge docuseries on this case. And she did something that was quite clever. Um, she drove and she dr left the same time Mara left. She did all the stops that Mara allegedly stopped at. And she timed her drive with a old FBI agent was in the car with her to see how the drive would go for Mara. And when she made the drive and she got to the, the site of the accident from UMass all the way to the site of the last known location of Mara at the accident, um, there they had an hour to spare. So we do have missing time, uh, potentially some missing time in the timeline that was given that's been given to the public of where Mara was and what Mara was doing. Right. So if she had gotten there like fifteen minutes earlier or 10 minutes earlier, that could probably be easily explained away by um, traffic, right? Or making a wrong turn and turning around. But the fact that it's a whole hour is very concerning as far as like, okay, we know our timeline might not be totally accurate. Now, I do also want to mention something that Maggie uh, speculated as well. And I, and I do respect her work. And I will say, I, I don't mean to sound like biased as far as being a female but the one thing that maggie has and myself i have and maybe um some other researchers have that the males who are researching this case don't have is female concerns you know like being a female alone you're gonna have a heightened sense of your surroundings than probably a male would have. And that's just a natural subconscious thing. And one thing Maggie pointed out when she, they pulled off the exit that led them to the spot where the, the car accident happened was two things. She said something, and actually, I actually quoted her on this. She said that the town was very small. We know that with very winding roads. It's mountain land. Obviously, they're very winding roads. And she said she either knew exactly where she is going or she had no idea where she was going. So with the fact that she was found at the base of the White Mountains, which she would go to a lot as a child um, hiking, yeah, she could have known this area pretty well um, to, to take this route to the White Mountains, but she also could have gotten off at the wrong exit. Again, you guys, this was for the young people watching. This was long before GPS. So she had print, uh, printed out a map quest where she had to read the map quest at night in her car 
and make certain turns. And I thought that was clever that she said either this girl knew exactly where she was going or got lost and had no idea where she was going. It was it was nothing in between that. You know, people also speculated that she might have been driving drunk. And um, Maggie gave her opinion, which I agree with, because I do also live at the base of Appalachian Mountains. And because there were so many winding roads that Mara had to take that night, if she were drunk, she would have wrecked way before her accident site. So Maggie Furling had said that she didn't think Mara was drunk. I don't think Mara was drunk either. And we're going to get more into that as we go deeper into these theories. So I just wanted to kind of give you that first so you understand why she was at the White Mountains. There was a connection there for her. We don't know if that route was her connection or if she had made a mistake getting off of the wrong exit. But thus, let's move forward. Now, where she was located was about 90 minutes. Um, I think I have that written down. Yeah, 90 minutes from the Canadian border by car. So she was very close to the Canadian border. So this has led a lot of people to speculate that Mara was running away. We're going to get into this because the main person who is pushing this narrative is an investigative journalist from Cleveland named James Renner. Now, James Renner is a very controversial investigative journalist. Um, and on the positive side, he did. He is the one that's super responsible uh, for bringing this case to the mainstream attention by utilizing things like blogs, social media, to really push uh, information about Mara and try to get more information about her whereabouts. Now, James Renner did come down really heavy on the family. He he alluded to things like her father being really heavy, hard on the girls. He even alluded to, an, either, in, either in his book, he did write a book about Mara Murray too. And I know there was speculation either in the book or on the blog about the father potentially sexually assaulting Mara. I don't believe that at all. I, I really don't. I think, I, I don't think James Renner um, has a bad heart. I think that he is a writer and I think that he got um, kind of in over his head. Like, I think he's created a story that he wants to believe is true. And I think he's created a sensational story over this girl. And I think that's part of him wanting her to be alive in some weird way. Uh, um, but we're going to get, he is very convincing though, but we're going to get into his theories. You guys don't, don't worry. So James Renner also believes the family has a lot of secrets um, in the docu-series, uh, the, the Disappearance of Mara Murray. Renner states that he believes Mara was running from the men in her life and is still alive. Now, Renner believes that Mara was potentially pregnant due to search results on her computer about the effects of alcohol on the baby. Now, we do know that Mara had a very tumultuous relationship with her boyfriend, Bill Rausch, and the family has come out and stated, especially her sister, that they weren't a huge fan of Bill. Um, and, and, you know, Bill has never really spoken out publicly, so this is just alleged let's just say alleged for now because i don't want to disparage somebody who might have just been young and dumb too um but with bill roush what we're looking at in this situation was was that bill had many reports from many of her friends of not being super good to mara apparently he cheated on her a lot they were in a long distance relationship and again they were very very young so this might not be an indication of who bill is today as a 40 something year old man but more it might have been just the behaviors of a young kid right um there were um It does sound like from from what I picked up from what some of his family was saying that maybe he wasn't also might have been a little bit of I don't want to say abusive, but maybe which is a little snarky mentally to Mara, which could have maybe affected her in a very, very negative way. Um, But needless to say, they did say that Mara like thought she was going to marry him, which to me isn't surprising when you're 21 years old and you've got a boyfriend. I think every girl kind of thinks that's the man they're going to marry. But um, if she was pregnant with Bill's baby, um, Renner believes that she did not want Bill to have any type of custody 
uh, for, with the child that he really believed she was trying to protect her child. And that was her main motivation for going to Canada. He also believes she was really like outrunning the men in her life. Like she didn't want her dad to be involved. She just wanted to be able to raise this child on her own. And at this point in 2004, to cross, and I question this too, like how easy really is it for somebody to cross into a new country with virtually no resources and start all over again? And, you know, we go through borders with our passports, they scan it so they know we're in the country. There would be easy, it would be easy to pinpoint to actually realize that someone had crossed borders because they can look through those files with people's passports. But in, in 2004, on the Canadian and the United States border, you didn't need a passport. You just needed your driver's license. So with that being said, it is it is possible that someone could have crossed the border without the Canadian government really knowing. It was just kind of a simple, just pass them on through, no big deal. And she could have gotten lost within the paperwork of of um, of the customs of, uh, of of Canada. Now, Renner believes that she was living closer to the Quebec area of Canada, which I kind of go back and forth on this, like the logics of this. So according to Mara's family, she didn't know anyone in Canada. So she would have no one to go to and she did not speak French. So why would a 21 year old girl with less than $300 to her name travel all the way up to the French area of Canada where she doesn't speak the language and successfully start all over again. All right. That's I, if I were in her position, I thought about that. Like if I were 21 years old and I found out I was pregnant with a, a man's baby that I, I realized in that moment that, Oh, Holy shit. Like this guy is not going to be a good father. I, he's abusive. I don't want him to, to even know he has a child. Where would I go? And I think I would actually stay in the United States. Now, I might try to go to the other side of the country and pick up a new identity, but I don't think I would leave the comforts of my own country. Given the circumstances, given that you're pregnant, given that you don't have much money, given that you're also disconnecting from friends and family who can help you out, you probably would want to stay in an area that you or a country that you at least knew, right? You know how to do things here, if that makes sense. But on the flip side, if you are trying to hide from somebody, then how clever to go to an area of the world where you definitely don't believe people will look because you don't speak French and you don't know anyone. Now, Renner was so convinced that Mara was living in Quebec that he actually took a trip up there in 2014 with two of the guys who run the Mara Mori podcast, because he had found a shop owner, a record owner, shop owner that, or clerk rather, that believes she had seen Mora. She said the girl came in, was obviously American, looked very athletic, um, was looking for venues, music venues that were small, um, where there weren't going to be any cameras. And he showed her a picture of Mora when she, the last known picture like when she was 21 and she said she recognized her but when they aged uh they when they went back and like added years to the picture and age regressed regressed her the clerk said all of a sudden no 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 this is not this is not the person i saw and so i think that kind of maybe take some of the eyewitness accounts you know and, and just because somebody saw a strange interaction in their shop maybe they want to they, they misremember that does happen sometimes where we misremember because we know it was strange and then we hear about this missing girl and so all of a sudden we, we we connect dots that that aren't connected at all and and so i don't think that there has really truly been any eyewitness accounts of mora in canada uh the people who do claim they thought they have seen her i don't believe that's who they saw claim she did have like a young a young boy with her so it you know that kind of gives some credence to renner's theory that she was pregnant however again i really don't think she went to canada and i really do think that renner has just taken this story and he wants to believe it's true like it's it's way more fulfilling to believe that somebody somebody is alive and they did not meet foul play and they're living a better life because they made the decision to to disappear now with the pregnancy and i immediately wrote this down in my notes because and we'll get to it i was actually uh validated because i wrote down in my notes when they were talking about the uh the possibility that she was pregnant i wrote in my notes wasn't she wasn't she in nursing school like wasn't she 
you know, it seems like if you were in nursing school that, I mean, let me know and sound off in the comment sections if you had to study uh, different uh, pregnancy issues, like how alcohol affects uh, a baby. You know, if I, if I, okay, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, but I know that you should not drink when you're pregnant. And if I was socially drinking and didn't know I was pregnant and then found out I was pregnant, I might go and Google it like, oops, just because I felt bad. And I wanted to see if I'd done any harm to the baby. But, but in reality, like a lot of people, there are a lot of women that did not know they were pregnant in the first stages and were still continuing to drink. And once they found out they were pregnant, they stopped drinking and it was no harm, no foul. The baby's fine. So I, I don't really see this as necessary, necessarily pointing to her being pregnant. I see this more as her just doing her homework for nursing school, you know, like uh, really as, as a doctor or a nurse, really understanding if you are a nurse in, in a delivery room and you're, you're helping bring a baby into the world whose parent is an alcoholic who did drink consistently throughout the pregnancy. I think that part of your, your job would be to understand what then the immediate help help the implications would be on the baby so that as a nurse, you can then help service the baby and, and, and getting the baby healthy, if, if that makes sense. So I, I wrote my notes. I was like, I she was a nurse. Like I would never come, jump to that conclusion right away that she was pregnant because again, she was a fucking nurse. She was going to nursing school. Now, if she had been like an English major, like me, and was Googling that, then maybe there's some more, there's, there's a little bit more, um, merit to to the speculation but i i just really think that had a lot to do with her um her education we also know that amongst her items found in her car in her duffel bag were birth control pills and four of these birth control pills were missing so this would tell us that most likely she was still taking her birth control we also know that bill Roush, her boyfriend, was stationed in Oklahoma about 1,700 miles away. So that kind of knocks him out, first of all, as a suspect in her disappearance. He was not there. He could not have been there. But I also wonder, and I don't want to pry too much into somebody's sex life, but what's the reality of when was the last time she saw him? Right? If this is, if Renner's theory is that she was pregnant with his baby, could we not go back and track when the last time was they were together? Because if it had been like a few months since they had been together, then there's no way she would have been pregnant with his baby because she would have already been showing at that time, right? This is, if she was pregnant, this is something she would have just found out, right? She was not showing. She would have just found this out. We saw no evidence anywhere of a birth control or a, a, a pregnancy test no evidence of her checking her blood nothing like that any you you ladies know like whenever you find out you're pregnant you find out you're pregnant because you you run a test in the beginning there was none of that in the bathrooms at the dormitories nothing nothing and we also do know that right before she disappeared she was still drinking so if she cared enough, if she were pregnant, if Renner was correct and she was pregnant and she cared enough to Google the side effects of drinking while pregnant, then she obviously cared enough about potential harm that she was causing her unborn child. And she probably would not have gone to that party a couple nights before she vanished where she was definitely drinking. And just so you guys know, Renner does believe that that party was her goodbye party. But still, I just don't, even if it was her goodbye party, even if she were pregnant and she was going to have one last hurrah with her, with her friends, let's look at this logically. Maybe if this were like 1994 or 1984 and her friends all had this secret, they were keeping the secret before, for her because they felt like her life was in danger, it would have been easier to keep because the, if it was 1994, before the, the invent of, of social media, the case would have just become a cold case and people, it probably would have never gotten the media coverage that this case got with it happening in 2004, the same week that Facebook was launched. And I just don't think that that many people could have kept this secret 
for 20 years. I just don't think so. I think, you know, a good intention that they wanted to keep her safe. I think somebody would have said something at some point to somebody else and we would know for sure, but there has been nothing. No one, none of her friends have mentioned anything about any knowledge of her whereabouts. Now let's kind of talk a little bit about the police cover up. And in the docu series, the, the dis disappearance of Mar Murray, they go really in depth into into the police. And they can, you keep going back. Like, is this just a podunk small town where the police are just not used to this level of scrutiny and they're not used to this and they just fucked up? Could that be it? Or are they literally hiding information? Are they trying to protect their own? Now, this theory of them trying to protect their own comes down to someone called Witness A. And this woman has kept her identity secret because she does not want the police to know who she is. We know from the police transcripts that the police got there at 7.46 p.m. But she claims that she saw a police car head to head with Mara's car at 7.37 when she was driving down the road, going home from work. Now, the thing about her testimony is that it has maintained the same for 20 years. She claims she saw another police officer there before talking to Mara, to Mara before the official um, timeline came out. And um, I go back and forth on this. Could it be that I, I do believe she saw something, but I don't know if she was correct on the time. They seem to, in the docu-series, they seem to, like, come up with a logical explanation as to why the police officer was there early. And really, it kind of was a dead end. Like, nothing happened. She, she, the police are not hiding, really hiding anything. The police have admitted that they did not handle this case very well. They have admitted that. Um, and you have to also remember that human beings are human beings. And police are human beings. And, um... Not every person, we, I know that many people are skeptical of law enforcement. I understand that. But we have to also remember that every, within every career, there are good guys and there are bad guys. And there are good cops and there are bad cops. And I believe that most people in this world are actually good. I do believe that. I do believe most people want to do the right thing and would never really hurt anybody, you know, intentionally. And so um, I think that they're the cops that have come forward to speak about it have been very apologetic that they just did not um, do enough the night that she went missing. And, and, I, and I, 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 I feel like we have to give them some grace because when they got to the wreck, it, it was I mean, the car was pretty banged up, but it wasn't like a bad wreck. Right. And, and she had literally just kind of tailspinned on um, on ice. You know, it was it was a accident that can happen to anybody it's it's not something that's immediately a suspect of drunk driving even though there was alcohol in the car and there was alcohol spilled in the car which makes people believe she was drinking again i think that it just spilled because of the impact uh, and they kind of uh believe that there's a possibility she ran into the woods to hide from the cops so that she could sober up so she would not get a dui and then as we know now that would then stacked against her with her identity theft charges um but the cops believe that she had just kind of walked off voluntarily because her purse was gone her cell phone was gone the car was locked so obviously she was trying to keep her belongings safe she locked it herself um and they also thought maybe she had walked down the road to try to find a neighbor or find a, a, a um, reception for her phone it was not that big of a deal to them in the moment now uh, one of the emts did notice a rag in one of the cylinders and he believed that that rag was potentially put there by someone so she would spin out and in the docu-series uh with maggie furling they actually did test this theory because they he said the emt said that was very odd that he'd never seen that before and he kind of believed that somebody had put that there intentionally so she would spin out but when they tested it, they, they, they brought in a Saturn specialist, a, a person who specializes in the, in the Saturn cars. And he got a 1996 Saturn, the same uh, kind of car that M Maura drove. And he made the car, he damaged the car, you know, because Maura's car was, as we stated, was not in good shape. And he stuck a, a rag in one of the cylinders and he, he revved the car up to about the, uh, the speed she was going, which they believe was about 25 miles per hour. And then they speeded, they, they hit the gas a little bit more and it spat the rag out. 
showing that the rag would have eventually come out of the cylinder. It was not the cause of the accident, even though it was very strange. Well, Fred Murray came back and said that she must have put the rag in the cylinder because of him. Mara's car was smoking. Like it was, it was not a safe car to be driving. And he had, he told Mara, he said many times he told Mara, do not drive your car unless it's absolutely necessary for you to drive your car. Do not drive your car. And he told her that because it was smoking so badly that the cops would probably pull her over. And if she absolutely had to drive a car just to put a rag in the cylinder so that the smoke would not come out. Now, this was probably Fred thinking like if she had to run to the grocery store quickly or something minor with an Amherst where she wasn't going to be driving miles and miles and miles away, which this is another um clue to me that this plan this trip that she this last minute trip she went on was indeed last minute because she knew her car was not reliable and um that would have been very stressful to be in a i've been in that situation with a car that's not reliable and having to drive a long distance and kind of crossing my fingers and constantly praying that my car is going to make it you know but for me, the, the times that I've had to do that with a beat up car, it was necessary. It was for work or for something that I, I, I was responsible for. So for her to decide last minute to go up to possibly the White Mountains, there was again a book in her car on the White Mountains last minute in a car that was not reliable is suspicious. Right. And does that go back to my theory that maybe she just did not have common sense? Maybe this was just an overreaction to anxiety. And so she wasn't thinking clearly. I don't know. But we can now eliminate this idea that somebody else put the rag in the cylinder because we know that Fred has said, no, I, I told her to do that. So she wouldn't she wouldn't um, draw attention to herself from the police. Now, the Murrays have also been very critical of the New Hampshire police. Um, they have filed lawsuits against the New Hampshire police because the New Hampshire police will not release information to them and i can definitely see both sides of this i as a parent um as a, for her siblings this has been going on 20 years now i cannot imagine the trauma that they're all living in because they don't know what happened to her they still have no idea where she is and so i i think that they were hoping the police would work with them and help give them at least some information so they had a better idea of what happened to her but the police have been holding back a lot of evidence, especially forensic evidence. Even though this is technically a cold case, it does seem like they still do have people actively looking into um, other clues. And I, I do get this. Like, I do understand why the, I, again, I understand both sides of this. Um, the police, we know sometimes will hold back evidence and not release it to the public or the family because they're trying to hone in on a suspect. And if the suspect says something that they never released to the public, then that's a better indication that, that they have their, they have their guy, right? If she was murdered, that they found their person. So I do understand why the police are holding back on some of this evidence. But again, I understand the family's frustrations too. I've been, listen, I've had to deal with the police with my stalker and um, I, it, it, I try to be very patient with the police because I know that they also have a lot of um, red tape that they have to get through. They have to dot all their I's and cross all their T's. And so sometimes the wills of justice will run slowly. I do believe that the cops were um, irresponsible. And I think that was because human nature, they just thought the, the girl had like walked off. Like they, they didn't realize that something nefarious might've happened. They thought she was going to be coming back. Right. So I understand why they didn't do as thorough of a search that night. It was also, pitch black dark outside in the mountains in a small town in the snow right so there's a, a lot of limitations they had with the elements of nature anyway so um so I, I i i think it's very admirable that they have basically put their hands up and said we fucked up we could have done more that night we just didn't uh, i think that's admirable that they have admitted to that i think that this is just a cluster i don't in my opinion, I know people in the comment section are going to want to think it's a police cover up, but I don't think it is. I just don't. I, I just think it's just an unfortunate situation. And I hopefully that the, the police in this area learned some lessons from this, this situation. And I do believe the cops that have come forward to apologize. I think they genuinely feel bad. They carry that guilt. They didn't do more that night. 
um, because they, they simply did not realize she was actually a missing person. They thought she just voluntarily left the, the scene of the crime. There was no crime, though. It was just a car accident. So the other, um, another theory we have is suicide. Now, in the opening um, part 1A, we talked about how in the timeline that there was a phone call Mara made at 1.13 p.m. and that we didn't know why she made this phone call to a fellow nursing student. Well, now I can tell you guys that nursing student has been located and she has been interviewed. Her name is Erin O'Neill. And basically, she said that Mara called her very upset and was telling her that sometimes they would car, sometimes Mara would hitch rides with her to their, because her car, again, her car was not reliable. So sometimes Mara would, would hitch rides with Aaron to uh, the hospital for their rotations and, and for their school as nursing students. And so she had basically called Aaron to tell her that she was going to be, uh, she had a family emergency which is what she told her professor in that email, that there was a death in the family and that she wasn't going to be in town for a while. And and Aaron said she was upset on the phone. Like she was, had, had been crying. And Aaron said she told her it was her sister. Something was going on with her sister. And so she had told Aaron as well that she had obviously borrowed some clothes for Aaron and she wanted to return the clothes to Aaron before she went, um, quote unquote, home for the family emergency. And Aaron had said, no, don't worry about it. It's cool. Just, you know, I can get him when you get back, go take care of your family. But Maura was so insistent upon bringing the clothes back to Aaron that she left them at Aaron's door in a bag in her dorm. So this definitely tells me that Maura knew she was going to be away for a lot longer than she was letting on. Um, again, she had told her professor in the, in the email that she would let the professor know when she was going to come back. So she was, it does seem like she was trying to like tidy up some loose ends before she went away. Now, Maura did something I did not tell you guys in 1.A. Uh, I held this back for this reason, because this adds another layer to the mystery. Maura did pack up her dorm room. So not only did she pack up a duffel bag for a little trip, but she boxed up her dorm room. Things that you do at the end of the year or you know, when you're leaving the dorm. She had put all of her stuff in boxes. She had taken down every poster and picture off the wall. She had sealed them all up. So it's almost like she knew people were going to come and look in her, look for her in the room. And um, it was going to make it easy for them just to get her stuff out. Like she did them a favor. She did her family a favor because she boxed everything up so they could just move the boxes into the U-Haul. Now... Could that be an indication that she was planning on committing suicide or that she was planning on running off to Canada? Yes. However, however, my friends, at 3.34 a.m. on Monday morning, early Monday morning, Maura did submit through email her homework, her nursing homework. She emailed it in. So if Maura was not planning on ever coming back, she was not planning on returning to school ever, i.e. she was going to go kill herself or go up to Canada, then why would she turn her homework in? It's not like it's a simple homework either. It's, it's medicine. It's a complicated project to turn in. And she took time on it and she turned it in. Why? If she wasn't coming back, if she wasn't planning on coming back, why did she turn her homework in. I think she was absolutely planning on coming back. I think she was just planning on taking some time, possibly even writing out the three months. That's my idea that she was going to try to live out the three months so that she would not have that credit card theft and identity theft on her record. And she just needed to be away from alcohol and, and 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 socializing in order to ride out that time that's just my my opinion though um because again why else would you turn your homework in if you're that depressed and you're about to commit suicide the last thing you're thinking about is your nursing school homework likewise if you are about to make the biggest escape of your life and run across a border into another country and start a new life the last thing on your mind is your nursing school homework just common sense here okay so for me that really eliminates suicide now in the beginning i told you guys to remember that she was a hardcore runner 
and therefore had was very physically fit and had a, a, a bigger capacity to take in oxygen. So one of the theories, too, is that Mora uh, was hiding from the cops and ran up into the mountains. And she could have easily gotten through the mountains because of her physical abilities, but that she got lost and nature took her out. However, that night when the cops were looking around, they saw no footprints in the snow. Okay. They have also extensively brought in searchers, people to search within a certain radius around the car uh, that's reasonable for someone to run or walk. And they have found no signs of any human remains. They've brought in cadaver dogs, nothing. And they've done this thoroughly a few times. And so for me, I think it's safe to say she did not run into the woods that night. Now, what they did pick up on with a trace dog, y'all, dogs are fucking brilliant. I love dogs. And I watched the, uh, I rewatched the docuseries with the, um, where they showed the dogs and how well dogs are. Dogs are reliable. Like they can smell better than almost any animal and they freaking are amazing. So they had a, cada a cadaver dog come in and they had a, uh, uh, a, a, a trace dog come in. So one dog was working with the scent of an alive human. And one dog was w looking for the scent of a dead human, a dead body. The dogs looking for a dead body did not find anything. However, the dogs that were tracing her scent followed her scent from her car a little ways down the road, and then her scent just stops. So this can safely tell us that Mara got into somebody else's car. Easy peasy. But this is where it gets interesting. And this is why I said in the beginning, this is like the stars aligned perfectly for this to happen. I don't think that Mara, I think she planned this trip last minute. I think after the ordeal with wrecking her father's car, because we see her father bringing her back to her dorm and then a little after midnight that, that early that morning of February 9th, she's looking at directions to the Berkshires and she's looking at places. That are, she's looking, she's like, I got to get out of here. Like, I'm going to get myself into trouble. I got to get out of here. And so for her, this was really important because she did not want that credit card and identity theft on her record. And so this is kind of getting into my speculation. And, and a lot of the locals also believe this. And it does seem that most people actually also agree with this. This is kind of probably what happened to her. The first 911 call was Faye, was placed by Faye Westman, one of the neighbors, at 7.27 p.m. that night. At 7.30 p.m., Butch Atwood, who was another neighbor that spoke to Mara, who was a school bus driver, saw Mara standing on the side of the road, pulled the bus over and said, are you okay? Can I call the police for you? And she pleaded with him not to call the police and said that she had called AAA. At that point, Butch knew that she was lying because he knew there was no cell reception there. So Bush drove his bus, Butch drove his bus to, to his house, parked the bus. Um, it is said that he sat in the bus for a couple minutes just to fill out the rest of his paperwork for the day, went inside and called the police between 7.40 and 7.43. With that timeline between 7.30 and 7.43, it does seem like that's the appropriate amount of time. I know people have speculated whether Butch had anything to do with her disappearance, but most people have said no, it's just not it fits. The timeline fits. And unfortunately, Butch did pass away about a few years after um, this happened. So we can't talk to Butch anymore. We know that the official police records say that the cops showed up at 746. So presumably three minutes after Butch called the second 911 call, the police showed up and she was not there. Now there was also neighbors. So you have the road, you have the Whit uh, Westman's across the street, Faye. Butch Atwood was down the street. And then there was another neighbor, the Marats, right here. All of them could see what was going on with the car accident through their windows. Okay, so they, they could all see Mara there. You know, it's a small town. It's really dark, except for the blinking of the hazard lights. So they all were kind of just watching, like, you know, rubbernecking, watching what was going on. So for Mara to disappear... For her to, it, it would have been within a seven minute window. 
for her to quickly hop in the car when all three of these neighbors backs were turned to the window would only have realistically happened within a 15 to 20 second window. Now, they ask the family if Maura would have accepted help from a stranger. And the family said, yeah, absolutely, she would have. You know, she was raised in a, a small town. She was a good girl. She would have accepted help from a stranger. So why did she not accept help from Butch Atwood? Well, my theory, this is my theory as to why she did not accept help from Butch Atwood is because she saw him as a threat. Not, not that he was a threat, but he wanted to call the police. And she saw him as probably being a grown-up. He was a lot older than her. She, she was a grown-up, too. She was 21, but she's still kind of a kid, right? And so I think she hesitated, and she did not want his help because she felt like he was going to get her in trouble. But what if a car pulled up? She's, she's walking from what the dog picked up. She obviously turned around and started walking down the street, probably to get cell phone reception, to probably call a friend. And a car must have pulled up, passing by, and picked her up. Now, the neighbor said there were a few cars that were passing by. It's Route 112 going in and out of work. Very possible. And for her to agree to get into the car with somebody, she had to inherently trust them. So was it somebody, a boy, a man that was closer to her age that she felt like maybe would understand the predicament she was in? We do know that she went back to her car and grabbed some liquor. So maybe she thought, okay, well, if they're going to take me to their house and let me call my friend, then I'll just give them some of my alcohol to say thank you. Um, we also have speculation that she knew this person or at least was acquainted with this person. Because if it is a complete stranger, they're going to pull their, like Butch Atwood did. It's going to take a couple of minutes to talk. Hey, how you doing? My name's such and such. What's your name? Do you need some help? But to, to only have a 15 to 20 second window to get in the car, that would have meant that she already knew who this person was. Now, James Renner, with his with her great escape to Canada, did believe she was driving in tandem with someone. Which I don't think many people believe that she escaped to Canada, but he does bring a good, up a good point with the tandem driving. We know from what Maggie Furling discovered that there is an hour missing. Is it possible that Maura stopped at a restaurant, a convenience store to get some food and happened to meet chatted quickly with the guy from the area and i say a guy because i do believe Ma mara was five seven so she was pretty tall for a girl and she was athletic i i, I don't she could outrun probably outrun i think of a, a, a man i definitely believe a man had something to do with this for sure um she might have met a man and just briefly maybe flirted a little bit and then got back in the car and then when he saw her wreck he took his opportunity and picked her up there is a snow resort, ski resort, um, a little bit further down Route 112. And there were a couple of boys that were working at that ski resort. And they were due to come in that night for a shift. And they never showed up. So that is a possibility that they picked her up and something happened. We do have the A-frame house, which there has been blood found. The A-framed house is off of a road, off of about a mile away from the car accident. They have found human blood in the closet of the A-framed house, um, and they have tried to test it. They cannot. They, they found two different DNA sets, one being a man, and one is unidentifiable. So they can't rule it out. It can be a woman, and but it's definitely human blood. We also know that the brother of the person who owned the A-frame house did go to the police and did tell the police he, he suspected that his brother had something to do with this, and he found a knife in the glove compartment of his brother's car that had what appeared to be human blood on it, and he did turn it into the police. With that being said, we don't know. The police will not disclose what was what the remains were on the knife. It could have been an animal, but they won't let us know that. So let's go with my theory. This We're going to end with my theory. This is what I think happened. Mara was high anxiety. She was in a very stressful situation. She had 
probably a lot of guilt from being kicked out of West Point. She um, was displ displaying signs of stress through her stealing and potential eating disorder. I don't think that this had anything to do with her family. You know, trauma is complicated. Stress is complicated. It could have been com coming from something completely different. I think she had a really good relationship with her family. They seem to be a very close and supportive family. I think that because the judge had given her a break and said, if you can remain clean for three months, then this will be taken off your record. I think after the wreck that she had in her father's Toyota, I think it pushed her over the edge. And I think she decided that in order to, to stay on the straight and narrow, it was a good idea in that moment of just to get out of school for a few months and to let the time run out where she was going to be isolated. I think she thought she only had less than $300. I mean, that was a lot more back in 2004, but obviously um, she knew the area. So she might have thought maybe I can get a part time job for a couple of months, you know, camp out if I need to just to kind of keep myself isolated until the time runs out so that I can return back to school and I'll have a clean record. I think that she obviously got into the accident. And I think because she did have alcohol in her car, I don't think she was drinking, but I think she panicked. I think she panicked because she had just been in a wreck literally a couple nights before. And I think that she was petrified that the cops were going to put all of this on her record and she would have this criminal charge on her record. And so I think that she decided she grabbed her purse after she talked to Butch Atwood. I think she grabbed her purse and her cell phone and decided that she was just going to go try to find a place where there was reception and potentially call a friend to come get her. That's what I think she was going to do. I don't think she was running from a sobriety test. I think she was just trying to get help from someone she trusted. I think before she she wrecked, I think that she did um, pull over somewhere to get food. And maybe there was a guy that thought she was cute. And when he passed her wreck and saw her walking down the road, thought, oh, here's my opportunity and picked her up. Now, some people do believe this could be the working of a serial killer. I don't know. I mostly believe this might have been a crime of passion. I think he maybe brought her back to his house where he was like, it's cool, it's fine, just chill here, we'll have some drinks, call your friends, and maybe he tried to make some advances on her, which she did not want, and maybe it got out of hand, and he accidentally killed her. Um, and I don't know what he did with the body. There's no telling. It's Appalachia. Her body may never be found. But that's what I think happened. I think that it was just a terrible, terrible set of circumstances. I don't believe that her disappearance has anything to do with what was going on in her personal life. But, however, I think that she was in the area she was in because of what was going. So that the things happening in her personal life put her in on Route 12 that night where she was trying to get away. But I don't think any of the things that she had done is what resulted in her disappearance if that makes sense. All right, you guys. So I'm try I keep wanting to say more about what I know from what other psychics have picked up, but I'm going to hold off on that when we do our remote viewing with Jessica after I hear what she has to say. Again, just to remind you guys, she has a blind target. She does not know anything about this case. She's going to see what she gets with the blind target. And I will be going through my notes again with her and talking through some of what she's found, see if we can connect some dots. If you do know anything about the disappearance of Mara Murray, please call the New Hampshire State Police. Anything at all that you might think you know, you never know. It could be the one tip that they need to hopefully find her body and bring this family closure. With that being said, stay tuned for part two, where we do the remote viewing of Mara Murray.